welcome to Practical AI. My name is Jeff and this is Peter. Uh, so today we're going to talk about generalization in uh, machine learning and AI. Um, remember, for more uh, videos like this, uh, subscribe and turn on the post notifications uh, to be notified every time a new Practical AI video comes out and other Guild content. And so let's get into the questions. Um, Peter, not, Peter, you um, kind of talked to me a little bit about generalization yesterday, but give uh, just an overview, a um, little bit layman, a little bit technical, so that people can get an understanding for the context of, of what it is. So the term actually comes from math originally, and computer scientists and professors and researchers have a thing for math. So the term was borrowed from there. The idea is basically, so when someone says a model is well generalized, they mean that they've trained it and it's good at recognizing the thing that they've defined. And so that means for each model you train, that term generalization is very specific to the features or the attributes that you're training the model to predict and to handle. And the kind of the simple example would be, let's say you want to train a model to recognize furniture. And one of the things you might want to do is recognize chairs. And there's different kinds of chairs. There's dining chairs, there's bean bags, there's love seats, there's couches. Um, and when a machine learning developer or a data scientist start the project, they have to first define, well, what chairs do I want to train my model to recognize? Now, so here's a picture here. We have a fuzzy beanbag chair. <laughs> we have a kind of a regular looking dining chair in the middle. We have a desk chair that you would see in an office. You have a, a kneeling chair, which is supposed to be more ergonomic. And then in the bottom corner there, you have the Game of Thrones throne. And as a machine learning developer or data scientist, your first job is to figure out like, okay, what's my use case? Like, am I building this for Amazon or is it for Bob's Furniture or is it for your local furniture store? And so that means you have to decide, okay, here are the kinds of chairs that we're going to sell. So obviously we're not going to sell a Game of Thrones. <laughs> so that would not be in your test data set. If you specialize in office equipment, you you might want to include the kneeling chair or you might not. It depends. Right. And so generalization then in this case is once you've collected the data and then you've trained your model, you're going to test it and say, okay, how well does it recognize an office chair? Okay, so what's the um, what's the inverse of of generalization or the opposite of it in in machine learning? So the opposite of it is so let's say I I get a data set of all beanbag chairs and I train it and it's fantastic at beanbags and I go into let's say Target and um I take my phone out and I'm trying to recognize a chair but it's a a dining chair. Well, it's not going to get it. <laughs> so the the, the, the data set there. that it was sort of trained on is limited in scope, or it's sort of predefined um, in terms of what um, the the context of what a chair is uh, right. to the data set, right? So right. Uh, it's in some instances, a, a stump of a tree could be a chair. Right. In or, the context of I need to sit down. Yep. But exactly. a stump of a tree in when you're a target, that's not going to help. So what you're saying is essentially if a model is either too narrow or too broad in terms of the data set, it might miss it might might misfire. Is that yep. Yeah. So usually you you want to be as broad as you need to be but not so broad that 
it takes you more time and effort to collect the data set, right? Like if, if I'm building a model just for a furniture store, I just need the stuff they're going to carry. I don't need to, you know, I don't need Victorian chairs that I'm never going to sell. <laughs> um, I don't need pictures of um, picnic benches. I don't need pictures of like portable foldable chairs that someone might use at a, at a sports event or a beach chair, if I'm not going to sell those things. Um, the downside is when you do want to sell new kind of chair, you now have to retrain it. And so from the, we can look at this term generalization from, from two perspectives. One is from the user and one is from the person that's training it. So if I'm using this app for, let's say, Amazon, and it doesn't recognize my chair, well, to me, it's not, it's not useful because it's failing to do the thing I want. <laughs> but from the developer's perspective, they can't take a picture of every possible chair on the planet. And what they need to do is train a model so that it covers maybe like 80% of the things that you're going to see. And then just assume that 20% is going to fail. And so in that sense, generalization isn't this like absolute thing of like, it's completely generalized. It's like, it's, it's generalized enough to do what you need to do, but there's always going to be room for improvement. Okay. So the way people are using um, AI right now, um, the chair store scenario for most, you know, people in this is, is that, you know, they're not doing that. They're either going into chat GPT and typing the word chair. Um, which is probably a little bit different, or they're asking a um, a an AI thing to, to to create an image of a chair. Yep. So maybe that's more relevant. What is um, how how generalized or whatever does the the model have to be in order for it to um, create art of a chair? um that you know isn't you know well, i suppose we could we could get specific more we'll bring up that image again you know is it do i do, if i just said chair does it think that it's not think but does it does it does it do the math and say well it could be an office chair or uh, just a regular dining room chair um or is it also considering whether it should do a throne? The answer to that is the way that ChatGPT and Dolly and other generative models for, for vision is they combine a, a language model with the image model and then a generative model. So there's three pieces. There's a language, there's a generative part, and there's an image part. And when you say, give me a picture of a chair by the beach, right? First thing is the language model goes, okay, what what did the person ask? You're asking for a chair. And it figures out, okay, so that maps to this thing. It tell it feeds that to the generative model that it wants a chair and it wants a beach. And then the generative model then looks it up in the image model and it generates something and then it returns that to you. Uh, so that, that's the general flow, but depending on what you train the language model on, it may have a very narrow definition of what a chair is versus if you train it on a broader set of data to have a more abstract definition of what a chair is. So a stump could be a chair, a wall could be a chair. The context of a chair in that case is anything a human can sit on or a dog can sit on or a creature can sit on is a chair. And so in that sense, it might generate, if, if it was generalized enough, it could generate a picture of a person sitting on a wall that's by a beach. So that would qualify as a scene of a person on a chair by the beach. But if it was really narrow, it might take an office chair, put it on sand <laughs> by the beach. 
which you might think like, well, that's kind of odd. I would never bring a desk chair to the beach. I bring a beach chair. But if you never train it on a beach chair, it wouldn't know how to generate that. And that's generalization, essentially. Right. So that's just how wide or narrow. So it sounds to me like generalization is is both desirable and problematic. It's desirable, that. but it's really hard to achieve. Especially if if you don't know the context. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. And, and the language model doesn't actually know or care what a human is or what sitting means. It just knows that in the English language, a human and sitting is related to a chair. So it just knows the relationship between those words. It doesn't understand that, well, if it's a hot day and I, I want a chair, it's because I'm tired. I'm probably dehydrated and maybe feeling a little woozy. <laughs> so I want to sit down. <laughs> so um, last question then. So as um, uh, programmers, uh, modelers are uh, creating these, you know, AI models, what is um, one of the um, sort of hiccups in the generalization space? How does that play itself out? as they are creating these models, what is, well, how does that manifest itself? The way that it manifests itself is you train as much as you can on the data that you have. And then someone has to decide, is it good enough to deploy? Once it's good enough, you deploy it. And then you have to have a mechanism for collecting situations when the predictions are bad. Is that a, considered an error? Um, it's considered a test case. Okay. Uh, the The most obvious example is Tesla's um, autopilot. When you drive with autopilot on, and let's say you're you're at a New England streets that has soft rights and soft lefts, and it's not it's not a it's not just a straight grid because Boston streets are weird. You've got like a right, a soft right, a left, and a soft left in the center. So you've got five different ways you can go. Um, and so, you know, it, it's, it's challenging for machine learning models to kind of figure out like, okay, most, so like if, Tesla had trained cars just in LA where all the streets are perpendicular to another, each other. Then it's easy to go, okay, we, we make a left and you get in the left lane. If there's a left turn lane. If there isn't, you've got the center lane. You pull in there, you turn on your blinker and you go. But if you're in Boston, you've got a left and a soft left. Well, okay. Now you're talking about, it's not 90 degrees anymore. Maybe the soft left is 15 degrees. Maybe it's more, you know. You know. <laughs> um, and so when a driver comes across a case where autopilot does not do the right thing or the owner feels like the auto autopilot was not handling it optimally, they can tap a button and then it'll, it'll save it. And then that situation gets saved and uploaded to Tesla. So that essentially becomes um, another part of the data training data set. It does, yeah. So Tesla collects it, and then on a regular basis in their workflow, it gets submitted, a human reviews it. They then do annotation to kind of give it hints. Once it's annotated, it goes into the database. Then it gets sorted and organized for like, this was a situation where maybe it took a turn when it shouldn't have because there was traffic issues. Like for example, there was a video recently by someone um, on YouTube where they had stopped at a, a light. The car in front of them made a left turn even though they weren't supposed to. And there was oncoming traffic. And Autopilot thought, oh, okay, well the front car went so i'm gonna go too <laughs> luckily the truck coming the other way broke and, and stopped in time 
and Tesla went. So the in the video, he tapped the button to say, okay, I'm going to send this to Tesla. And so now once Tesla gets it, their human beings will look at it and they'll decide, okay, yeah, we should rank this. Was this a little bit bad, questionable, acceptable, or really bad? They'll annotate it. Then it goes in the training data set. And then at night or every week, or whatever, they'll run the training. And then they'll run it in simulation in a virtual world. And they'll try to test it to make sure that it does the appropriate thing. So they're trying to get, um, they're try it sounds like generalization is kind of a sweet spot. And you're trying to get into a sweet spot of generalization where it's not too generic. Yep. It's it's optimal for the, the use case. And in this case with Tesla driving, yeah. You want to be able to hit the roads that 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 Tesla is going to be driving on. Yeah. Right. And originally when they first launched the beta program, Autopilot had a hard time with roundabouts. We all have a hard time with roundabouts here. <laughs> right. Cause like when they originally trained it, it was stop signs, it was lights. All the streets are perpendicular. Roundabout, you could have two or three or five or any number of entry and exit points. Like if you're in France and you're you're in Paris, the famous roundabout has like six different entry points. And so now you you train your, your model on LA streets that are perpendicular. You go to Paris and you're like, uh, the streets are at odd angles. <laughs> and so now it, it, it gets dumb. It's like it gives you the warning, like, human, please take over. It beeps at you. Mm. So you have to do it. And what Tesla does is it beeps at you, but then it records what you did. And then um, it'll use that to then do additional training so that as they train it, you know, for other, for other countries or other places, like if you're in Europe, they might drive on the other side of the road. Right. And so now all the rules about being on the right side of the road is flipped and now your your model has to be generalized enough to know like oh okay i'm in the u.s i'm in america so we drive on the right side of the road if i'm let's say in in um in england drive on the other side of the road and then there's things like markings on the road are different and so a system that's well generalized for england probably is a more generalized for Africa where there's no markings. <laughs> that's great. Okay. Well, that's, uh, that's helpful. Um, thanks for living, listening, everybody. Um, for more information on the topics we discussed today, just check out the links in the description below. And uh, for more videos like these, check out our channel and don't forget to subscribe. See you next time. Thank you. Thank you.